Just when I thought I was out, they pull me right back in. Hey guys, what's up? And today I'm here to do something I haven't done in a really long time, and that's review an episode of Ruby. Yes, yes, I know, I know, I know. It's been a really long time since I have done a Ruby video. I have not talked about Ruby at all since volume four. I'm gonna give a little bit of an update on Ruby, like my personal thoughts on Ruby and things and why I didn't stop reviewing Ruby, why I stopped pretty much watching Ruby and everything like that. So if you actually want to get just straight to the, vid to the review for volume eight, episode one, um, you can skip to the time here or here or here or wherever I decide to put it in editing. I do want to get onto the episode review, so I'm hopefully not going to be talking about this for too long, but uh, Ruby, Ruby was one of the first shows I reviewed on my channel. Um, you know, I would, I got into it from the very first episode, actually before the trailers even, um, uh, like the trailers, I was I was watching the trailers and reviewed the like the first episode like the week of its release. I just really got into it really quick and just started making videos on it. That this was back in the time when there were not a whole lot of Ruby content creators out there. The, the there have been a load, and I mean a lot of people that have gotten into watching Ruby, especially some of the bigger channels because they started realizing it's really popular and everything like that. Um, this is back in the day when Ruby wasn't as popular. It really took off after Volume Three. And um, that's when everyone started jumping into it. And that was one of the first things that kind of made me, discouraged me a little bit from making Ruby content. Um, because Ruby content was one of the bigger things on my channel at the time. I, my channel didn't have a whole lot going for it at that point. I had the Attack on Titan videos, the free videos, and Ruby videos, and that was about it. Like, I just didn't have any sort of variety of content on my channel back then. You know, now I do all these different types of videos, like with the tier lists and like, I don't know, just random videos that I make, where I just because I think there'll be going to be some funny ideas. Um, I didn't do anything like that back in the day. All I did was reaction videos instead of, you know, trying to make some like newer, maybe fresher content. And so when all all these people started hopping on Ruby after the catastrophic finale of, and I say catastrophic in the best way possible, I mean it was just really, really big, a uh, finale of Volume 3, um, you know, I, it started taking away a little bit of my viewerships, and I didn't get as many views on my Volume 4 stuff as I did with my Volume 3 stuff, and Volume 2 stuff, and Volume 1 stuff. All the, the first three volumes of Ruby, that was like the height of my Ruby viewership. I was really getting a lot, I was getting a lot of steady viewership uh, during the time, and then when everyone jumped in, you know, especially the bigger names uh, in the anime reviewing, you know, kind of community, um, you know, that just kind of took away from a huge portion of my channel. I didn't feel as motivated to make content because um, not as many people were watching it. But as far as viewership, I wouldn't consider that a ginormous reason. Um, you know, I don't really make content because like something's popular. Um, I mean, the most popular video on my channel is the ranking of the homunculi from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. And I have not made a single video like that because I can't come up with any good ideas. I'm only going to create something if I think I can make it well and I want to create it. I'm, I mean, I am open to suggestions and everything like that, but if I don't think I can do it well, I don't want to post some crap video on my channel. I, even though the first pretty much 150 videos on my channel when I was like freaking 15, or, or how old was I? I don't know. I was really young back then, and you know, I just, I put a lot more effort in my videos now, and so I want that to reflect it. So if I can't make a quality video on the topic, I don't want to make a video on it. So that's the main driving factor for me making videos, not entirely viewership. I mean, the, the last 10 videos I've posted, I've barely got broken like 100 views. I don't really care. I just did it because I think those videos are fun to make. But the biggest thing that drove me to stop making Ruby content is I just kind of fell out of love with Ruby, honestly, after Volume 4. So after Volume 3, I knew that Ruby was going to have a hard time following up on that volume because that volume was so amazing. And the, Volume 4 started off pretty strong. I was getting really hyped. Um, and then Volume 4 just listed. I, I, I started getting bored in the middle of Volume 4. Um, I, I, I was making Volume 4 content, and then, man, the middle part of that season, I was just so bored. I, I just, like, I didn't feel like making a video over an episode where, like, I don't know, nothing really cool happened. All I care about is the quality of the show. And Volume 5, man, that was... That was, I'm just gonna say it straight, that was not a good volume. I mean, volume five was a real shit storm uh, in, in terms of quality for me watching Ruby. I thought volume five was so far below the standard to what I held Ruby to, and like Ruby was such a big, 
portion of, you know, like one of the biggest shows. I loved it and I followed it for so long. For five years straight, I had been watching it weekly. And man, volume five, that was just such a dumpster fire. And so after volume five, I just kind of lost my interest in the show. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I stopped caring about Ruby after volume five because volume five was that bad. I didn't watch volume six weekly. I didn't watch volume seven weekly. I had no interest in making Ruby content anymore. You know, the amount of Ruby reviewers out there had just had gotten so large. I figured, you know what? Like, I'm not even interested in the stuff anymore. So I don't even think I can offer a unique opinion that isn't already out there. So I'm not even gonna bother with it anymore. Like, you know, Ruby was great. Um, it seems to have lost its, its track. I mean, that's a shame, but you know, there's other shows to watch out there. So let's just go watch something else. And that appeared to be that. I thought that was going to be the end of anything Ruby related that I would ever talk about again. I honestly never thought I would watch the show again. But then I started hearing some stuff about volume six that was going on uh, during the time. I didn't watch it weekly, like I said. I, um, I didn't watch any of volume six until actually it was almost the premiere of volume seven when I started watching volume six. I marathoned all of volume six in a few days. Um, I gotta admit, I thought Volume 6 was a very good step in the right direction. I, I, I particularly liked the episode, The Apathy. I feel like that episode alone is better than the entirety of Volume 5. It wasn't completely fixed. I, I, don't, I don't think it, it's... I didn't think Volume 6 was still on the same level that like the earlier volumes were. Uh, especially in terms of action. But I, I do think that plot-wise and character-wise, Everything was moving more in the right direction after the complete shitstorm that Volume 5 was. And then with Volume 8 premiering this week, um, I just decided I'm going to watch Volume 7 because, like I said, my hopes had been getting up again with Volume 6. I still tried to keep my expectations low going into Volume 7. I didn't know how they were going to handle it. Um, there were def I definitely had a bunch of problems with Volume 6, even though I liked it more than Volume 5. But saying I like something more than Volume 5 or Ruby isn't really saying much. <laughs> So then I go into Volume 7, and I got to admit, I really liked Volume 7. Like I said, I thought I was out, they pulled me right back in, I'm, I'm reinvested in the story. Volume 7 was, was really good. I, I, I enjoyed Volume 7, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I mean, was some of the dialogue pretty cringy? Yes. Was some of the character actions pretty cringy? Yes. Was the story kind of predictable? Yes. However, I just liked the plot developments. I really liked what they were doing um, with the, the story. I just, I just thought the story was evolving at this really um, cool angle, and I, I just liked that we were seeing more interactions from the villain side. And like, I, I always, I loved all the uh, things with Watts finally showing his stuff and like, you know, actually doing something in the show, which was really cool. After seven seasons, we finally see a guy who's supposed to be one of the big bads actually doing something in the show, that's right. And you know, we see Neo again, and man, I gotta tell you, I thought the action was mwah. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, um, that fight between Team Ruby and the elite forces, I was, I, my mouth was gaping open. I, I, that move where Yang and Blake took out, I think her name's Elm, the, 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 the bulky lady. Uh, they took her out. I was just like, holy crap, you know, and then everything with Ironwood like when Ironwood shot Oscar I was like, whoa, okay This is I mean, I do think it was a little abrupt and I do think they're going for this like they're trying to make Ironwood this morally gray character when in fact he's just like evil. So yeah, I'm not saying it was perfect There's still plenty of narrative and character flaws in the show but like I just liked the season. I thought it was just really entertaining. Like, like regardless from a critical standpoint, I could sit here and nitpick like all these things I could, because I did have, like I said, I do have criticisms for Volume Seven, but this isn't a Volume Seven criticism video. I'm just telling you, like, Volume Seven has brought me back into Ruby. I thought Volume Seven was pretty great, and that brings us into Ruby Volume Eight, Episode One. So, kind of following the formula of Ruby and pretty much what it's been doing for the past. Eight years. We start off with a setup episode. Shocker, I know, right? It's surprising that we're gonna start off a season of Ruby with a setup episode where not a whole lot happens and they just talk the whole time. But there was actually some interesting things that happened within uh, this whole episode of talking. So for one, I do like how we have some different group dynamics going on. Um, you know, a theme of Ruby has always been division 
and division is Salem's ultimate goal. She said in, in volume three, she wants to divide humanity because that's when they're at their weakest. And we can definitely see some division going on within the main cast. I mean, I even noticed in the opening, they kind of had their two groups. You had the mantle group and then you had the Atlas group. And it just seems like there's a whole, I'm, I'm glad that they're finally adding a little bit of depth to the character interactions and they're not always just constantly getting along with each other and especially Yang and Ruby. I was really surprised to see Yang criticizing Ruby. Um, you know, that's something that I, I was not expecting because she's never done that. She's always like Ruby's number one fan, like acting like kind of like a mom to her a little bit. And like seeing Yang say like, you know, we've been following, we said we would follow your lead, but you haven't really been doing a good job. And like, you know, I don't agree with you. I think you're wrong. Like she was really going in on Ruby and I was not expecting that. And that was really cool to see just like this negative dynamic going on within the group instead of always getting along with each other, unlike real life. Like for real guys, I can't tell you the amount of times I've wanted to punch my friends in the fucking face. Like, like you have arguments with your friends in real life. That's how real life is. It just seems, it just makes the whole dynamic a little more realistic now that they're not always constantly 100% getting along with each other all the time. So that was really great. And I, I also just a little fanboy thing. I, I really like that scene with Penny and she turned around and she was like I'll go and her eyes were like Phew. I mean yeah that was cool I, I'm, I'm still kind of like I mean did I per as soon as I saw Winter not get the power and like Cinder showed up but Penny was there like it was like episode 12 or something I was like okay yeah Penny's gonna be the maiden I, I knew that immediately like I said the story's kind of predictable as soon as you see things they don't really kind of flip it around too much but it's still cool just because it's predictable doesn't mean I don't like it so on to the bad guy side we see some reintroduction of some old characters we haven't seen in a while namely Hazel Mercury and Emerald and they all went through an outfit change which I'm assuming was just necessary because everyone went through an outfit change last season even Salem for some reason she needed to like put on some dress to show off her cleavage I guess I don't know also what was up with Cinder taking credit for Neo Cinder didn't really do that much Neo pretty much saved the day like if Neo had failed and Cinder had done exactly the same there is no way that they neither of them could have gone and seen Salem I did like seeing the bad guy group dynamic again because they're all roasting each other as usual I mean Tyrion came in and Tyrion man they just love Cinder is like the freaking George Costanza of the bad guy group but also what I found really interesting at the end of volume 7 and of course that's continuing on into this volume is the fact that Salem's actually coming out into the open now and I guess that's more has to do with James revealing her uh, existence to the world and everything you know she's actually launching like this whole time she's always been playing in the shadows like when she took down beacon it was all behind the scenes she wasn't doing anything herself really and now she's like just leading an army of grim on her like whale kind of jatari like troop transport i guess i don't really know that grim it looks like a whale i'm assuming it's a whale that's quite big impressive like she's actually just launching a full frontal assault like she's like screw being in the shadows like let's just roll over this city because we can so it's definitely a different dynamic that we're going to be feeling going into this season because it's less of more of like espionage and kind of like doing everything low-key and it's just more like all-out war at this point so it seems like we're kind of going to have the story presented or at least i'm assuming we're going to have the story presented at like kind of um how ruby has been doing it like they did in volume four you know we're gonna we're gonna keep bumping around between the different groups uh we're gonna have the atlas group going to uh, that's good i think that's penny nora ruby blake and weiss and then we're going to have the mantle group which i believe is oscar jean ren and yang and then we're probably going to have the things going on uh, in atlas with ironwood and the elite cores uh, and then also the bad guy group i'm assuming we're just going to be bouncing around between those four groups so I'm assuming every episode the plot isn't going to advance too much kind of like in the problem with volume 4 Like that's kind of what I'm afraid of is like the problem with volume 4 and why volume 4 felt slow is because they kept bumping around Between all four of the groups that were there it was, you know Ruby because Rup team Ruby was all split up So they had to keep bouncing around every episode between all four groups So the total plot just wasn't advancing much every episode because there were four individual plots that they had to push at the same time And there's only so much time you can do that with i'm worried that volume 8 that might happen but 
they did a good job of keeping the plot advancing in volume seven so I'm hoping we can just stick with that formula. I really hope it doesn't drag like it did in volume four. Though with everything that's going on right now, I don't see how it could drag. And speaking as to things that are going on, the last thing um, that happened in this episode that was really big, of course, was Ironwood's just straight up execution of the council member. Um, and only the guy won, uh, the woman wasn't killed, which is, uh, why? I mean, if you're gonna, like, do basically, like, a hostile takeover of the existing government, you kinda have to kill the previous government. You have to wipe them out. And, you know, every dictator in history has shown us that that's the way it works, at least for a little while. So I was just curious as to why he shot the man and not the woman. I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, of course, James has a new arm. He's more machine now than man. And, you know, James Ironwood, his character inspiration, you know, I, I don't know if you guys knew this or not. I'm sure you guys did. It's been eight years at this fucking point. But um, all the big heads of the academies are all based on the Wizard of Oz characters. Um, Ozpin is the Wizard of Oz. Um, Leo Lionheart, he was the Cowardly Lion and Ironwood is the Tin Man, and the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz was looking for a heart. He didn't have a heart, and, you know, Ironwood has just basically become this cold-hearted, you know, basically remorseless guy who's going to do whatever it takes in order to uh, protect Atlas. I mean, I knew James was going to do a hostile takeover of the government at some point. I mean, ever since his introduction in Volume 2, when he's just been military, 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 we need more guns, we need more ships, we need more cannons. I don't know, he's always been like that. So I knew that something like this was going to happen as soon as we saw him in Volume 7. I just expected a little more finesse. I didn't think he would just walk out in the hallway in front of his elite troops, and in front of Winter, in front of the councilwoman that he spared for some ambiguous reason in front of the other uh in front of those grunts and he just fucking <laughs> yeah i don't know i'm i'm just i'm really hoping we start getting a little more depth from these elite troop guys i actually like the elite troops um you know i like marrow and i like harriet i like elm and i like krillin or whatever his name i just call him krillin I, I don't know what his name is i think his name is like vine or something but i definitely want to see more out of the elite troops i'm hoping that they stop with this whole like like especially from winter and just I and I know that Atlas is a militaristic society that's just how you know they they're groomed that's how they're trained as children they behave in a militaristic way they're they're taught to you know conform and everything like that i'm just hoping we can see a little more independent thought out of them because do they have independent characters like characteristics Absolutely. As far as distinguishing characteristics, they do have like their own personalities and stuff, but just being a soldier in general is plain and bland. So I, I kind of want to see a little more um, conflict within them. And I don't know, we might see that a little bit because I, I was, they, were, they were dropping hints of that with Harriet and Winter at the end. And I'm hoping we see some more out of that. I'm, I'm hoping they actually take it in some direction besides like, oh, we're soldiers, so we follow orders. By the way, I'm only talking about like fictional soldiers like that are fake in a made up universe that aren't real. None of this is real, guys. All right, I'm not talking about real soldiers, all right? I have tons of friends in the military, so please don't shit on the military. But anyway, for a setup episode, I definitely think it's one of the better setup episodes out there um, that you're gonna find in Ruby. There are some definitely some very bland uh, setup episodes to be found within Ruby. So I'm glad that we're getting a little more of a unique dynamic within the main cast, um, as well as within these uh, supporting characters as well. I, I you know, I, do I think it's a little like cliche like kind of like you, like I said they're trying to make Ironwood this morally gray character when really he's just kind of evil and he's just doing like evil crap now so it's it's a little heavy-handed on that but I, I am really glad to see that they're trying to make things a little more complex uh, with the characters and so you know is it perfect no but hey progress is progress and the last thing I want to hit on was that opening um, I gotta admit this has probably been the best opening since volume 3 I was really I really love this opening just uh, everything first of all the music of course Casey Lee is fantastic she's always been fantastic Jeff as well I've had a lot of complaints about Ruby one complaint I've never had about Ruby is the music the music has always been 100% stellar I have never 
nothing but the highest of praises for uh, Casey Lee and Jeff. Fantastic artists. I, I, I loved listening to him. I still listen to I listen to Bad Luck Charm like at least like two times a day. Like that's one of my work. It's in my workout playlist. So just the music alone was fantastic, but I really also enjoyed the visuals too. I, I mean like just the way they keep flashing and everything like that and uh, the things they were alluding to in the um, uh, the opening just like with the division like we've noticed like I said in the opening they kind of had that clear divide between the two groups um, even though they do join up in the end to fight together um, and then we also see like all these other things um, like with Cinder and she kind of like just walks past Emerald and that's another thing I forgot to touch upon was that little scene at the beginning with um, I'm assuming with Cinder scrubbing the floors so like it's it's kind of like I think Cinder's based on Cinderella. Is that right? I'm not entirely sure, but everyone's based on something in this show. Yeah, that shows like her very destitute beginnings and like why she became so power corrupt. And like Cinder's always been this very cocky figure. She's always seemed like every time she walks into the room, she just like flops her dick on the table. But her whole interaction with Salem, like I was just getting some, I was just getting weird feelings from that whole interaction. Like just Salem put her in her place like completely and cinder taking it like a champ i don't know i was expecting a little more resistance cinder's a very opinionated character and obviously she all she craves is power but i feel she submits to salem because she knows that like salem is the reason she even has any power to begin with she would still be powerless if it wasn't for her so that's probably the reason why she's so submissive but like that whole interaction I was just like wow like she's really telling Cinder her place right now so the scenes in the opening with Cinder and everything just I, I, I got some sort of feeling that maybe we'll see some sort of development from Cinder that would be great because you know there hasn't really been you know she's kind of like the Vegeta of this show she just wants more power and, and yeah I understand like we she's a villain so we need non altruistic reasons like to motivate her character and everything but you know once again just having unlimited power isn't really like a really in-depth doesn't make a character very deep is what I'm saying but I I, I adored the opening I, I I watched it four times actually at the end of the episode I couldn't stop watching it I that I love that end scene too where they're like falling and you can see Ruby's hand is going up like this and then the grim just come in and like just shadow it up and then they kind of do like it's almost like a like a grainy kind of like manga scheme. Almost, I want to say manga scheme just because I'm a nerd. But like it was like a grainy cut with all the weapons and stuff, and it's like like happy ever after that is blanked out with never happy never again. And I, I was just like, holy crap! Like you know, we haven't gotten these dark vibes from an opening since volume three, so maybe we're gonna see a main character death guys so brace for impact you know i did have that ruby theory video um from four years ago i think four years ago that i said uh, the ruby theory was all the members of team juniper are gonna die so guys that pretty much sums up everything i had to say about ruby volume 8 episode 1 i do think it was one of the better starts of a ruby volume and so i'm interested to see where it goes um at, for the moment the show has my attention again um until it loses it, I will try to uh, make Ruby reviews uh, every week. I, I, I you know, I, I, I've been pulled back into the show, and I want to see what if, if it can really uh, make a comeback for me. And I'm interested to see what will happen. So with that being said, I want to thank you all for watching. If you can, please hit the like button to let me know that you liked this video and enjoyed it and want to see more like it. Um, if you guys have your own theories or thoughts on the episode or pretty much any episode of Ruby between volume 5 and now you can go ahead and leave it in the comment section below and I'd love to hear your opinions and everything also if you aren't already please subscribe to the channel it would help me out a lot and I would really appreciate it so once again thanks for watching I'll see you next time bye